Wonderful, the webinar is live. Welcome folks, good afternoon. It's good to have you with us, welcome. The doors are open, so to speak, and folks are settling into their seats at home. I'm gonna just wait for a few minutes so we can get our attendees um, all settled in. I see our numbers climbing, which is wonderful. Um, thank you all so much for being with us. I am Leo, the Assistant Director of Student Life here at Bakersfield College. Um, I am with one of our esteemed faculty, Professor Pat Smith, uh, from the criminal justice uh, departments and then we also have our esteemed guest james r fitzgerald who is our guest speaker kicking off our distinguished speaker series this year thank you so much for being with us both uh, we'll just give folks a few minutes here to get settled in it's 201 now and we'll make sure to get this program going by 205 just so folks can make it in the link Nayeli, I'm so glad to hear that. I see your message in the chat. I can assure you uh, we had the session earlier this morning, kind of round one, and it was fantastic. Uh, we're happy to have uh, James here back for our second program of the day. Uh, thank you again, James, for joining us this afternoon. Really happy to have you and can't wait to hear all of your experience um, really from start to finish on multiple cases. So thanks so much, Nayeli, you were, you're in for a treat. We'll give folks a few minutes here Welcome to everybody just joining us. I am Leo, Assistant Director of Student Life here at Bakersfield College. I will be introducing or kicking off our program. We'll just give folks a few minutes to join us. That way they can get settled in and then we'll get, we'll get rocking after that. Welcome everyone. Welcome, good afternoon. Hey Raul, I see you. Monica, Mary Jo, thank you for joining us. Shailene, Serena, Lonnie, thanks so much for being with us this afternoon. Jessica, Ethan, Hal, thank you everybody for being with us this afternoon. I am Leo, Assistant Director of Student Life. We're just letting folks join us here, give them a couple more minutes to join and we'll get this program started at 2.05. In the meantime, make yourself comfortable. We'll be we'll be moving along soon. Okay, our numbers have stabilized, I think. I think we're about ready. Pat, James, y'all ready to get this party started? Let's go. Absolutely. Okay. All right, y'all, so welcome. Uh, we are kicking off our Distinguished Speaker Series event this year with our esteemed guest, James R. Fitzgerald. We'll have a proper introduction offered by our professor, Pat Smith, in a little bit. Um, I'm Leo, kind of kicking things off. I just want to cover a couple housekeeping items. You know, one of the benefits to the virtual environment is getting hosts from all over, um, but there are a couple technical things that we need to cover. And so without further ado, just to kick us off, I wanna share a little bit about that. One, welcome. Thank you for joining today's Distinguished Speaker Series event at Bakersfield College. Uh, this is hosted by the Bakersfield College Student Government Association and the Office of Student Life in collaboration with the Laban Institute for Lifelong Learning. Um, these webinars and many other student-centered events are made possible by our BCSGA KVC Student Services Program, uh, which students have the option to get at the time of registration. 
Uh, through that program, we're able to offer multiple events around campus, including our Distinguished Speaker Series. If you have any questions or looking for more information, uh, please visit bakersfieldcollege.edu forward slash BCSGA. So thank you again. Um, a couple housekeeping notes here. The webinar will be recorded and made available for up to two weeks after the event for students. This will be posted on our YouTube page where it'll be available for two weeks uh, following the program today. Closed captioning is also available uh, by simply clicking the closed caption button at the lower part of your screen. Closed captioning is helpful to me. I hope that it is beneficial for you. Uh, this is a webinar event, so you will not be able to show your video or talk through. However, we do have the chat feature enabled to engage with the panelists and other attendees. Um, please note that all inappropriate questions and or comments will be removed immediately. However, if you'd like to pose a question for our guest today, also in the lower part of the screen, you should see a Q&A button. This is to submit your questions to us. At the end of today's program, we will have a Q&A section. So we hope that we can review the questions and ask them at the end of the speaker's presentation. We may either respond to the question live or respond it via the module. Okay, a little bit about the DSS uh, event. D Distinguished Speaker Series brings leaders from all around the world to Bakersfield whose achievements have had national and or international significance. Each speaker was proposed by excuse me, to BCSGA, our Student Government Association, by either a department or faculty member. So collaboration between many entities on campus happens uh, to make these events successful each year. Uh, the events are always free, always open to the public. And this year, most of our DSS series will be scheduled via Zoom. Uh, this afternoon, we have James joining us from Maryland. Is that right, James? Yes, correct. Yep, and so we're so thankful to have him be able to join us here remotely and open it up to everyone here at BC. For more information on future speakers, I'll drop the link later, but you can always visit us at bakersfieldcollege.edu forward slash student events forward slash DSS. Um, please note, since today's webinar will be recorded and we are online, we know that the technical issues may or may not arise, but please stay online as we work through them. We'll always try to get back up and running as soon as possible. Great. Um, this is the second presentation for today. We'll be uploaded to YouTube after. And without further delay, I want to welcome Professor Pat Smith, Professor of Criminal Justice here at BC, to introduce today's distinguished speaker. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Leo. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our first distinguished guest speaker webinar today. I am Professor Pat Smith, and I teach criminal justice here at Bakersfield College. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest speaker today, Mr. James R. Fitzgerald. James R. Fitz Fitzgerald remains an active criminal profiler and forensic linguist with his company, James R. Fitzgerald Associates, LLC, even after retiring in 2007 with 20 years in the FBI as a supervisory special agent along with 11 years before that as a police officer, detective sergeant on the in Salem, Pennsylvania Police Department. During his extensive and varied law enforcement career, he successfully investigated numerous homicides, sexual assaults, kidnappings, bank robberies, and other violent crimes, as well as matters of inter international notoriety to include the Unabom, John Benet Ramsey, Anthrax, and DC sniper cases as a profiler and or a forensic linguist. Jim's role in helping to solve the Unabomb serial bomber investigation was highlighted in Discovery Channel's scripted miniseries, Manhunt Unabomber, which aired over eight weeks beginning August 1st, 2017. In it, he was portrayed by actor Sam Worthington. Jim served as the consulting producer on the series. Jim was one of several renowned experts on CBS television's four hour documentary series, The Case of Joan Benet Ramsey, which aired in September, 2016. He was also a featured expert on Oxygen Network's The Case of Kaylee Anthony. He appeared on Reels Channel's Notorious which premiered in March, 2019. Jim was one of two technical advisors 
for CBS TV's Criminal Minds. James R. Fitzgerald is a graduate of Pennsylvania State University with a BS in law enforcement and corrections. He also holds an MS from Villanova University in Human Organization, Organizational Science and an MS from Georgetown University in Linguistics. So we are very fortunate to have James here today. Are you ready to go, James? Yes, I am looking forward to it. Thank you very much for being here today. Well, thank you for that great introduction, Pat and to Leo for facilitating this aspect of my talk today. I also want to uh, uh, thank President Databoy and Vice President of Student Affairs Morzanos, the Bakerfield College Student Government Association, as well as the college's uh, students, staff, and faculty, and you, the audience, who are who are live streaming this today. So thanks uh, for all of you for putting this thing together. And I'm honored to be the first guest here uh, uh, of, this, of this particular year anyway, with your distinguished, uh, distinguished lecture series. So great to be here. Um, I'll kind of go through an hour and a quarter of a, or an hour or so of a presentation and a little bit of Unibom, uh, some cases on the end, and then we'll do a Q and A afterwards. So if you think of a question, you just type it in and Pat will get that to me uh, afterwards as, as long as we go. So uh, yeah, let's, let's kick in here and talk about this particular investigation. I always like to joke around a little bit if you were looking for this guy, uh, sorry to disappoint you, that is Sam Worthington. Uh, he portrayed me in the mini series, which is still on Netflix, uh, if you care to watch it. And I met him in person and we communicated, good guy. He's now very busy doing the sequel to Avatar which uh, will be out at some point, I am told. Um, that is the banner for the mini series, Paul Bettany portrayed the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski. Um, I wrote three books in my memoir series. This is the third book. You kind of see the cab in there, you see a cake, and you'll learn a little bit more about a cake, how it plays into this case with a, a bomb fuse hook to it. So the last chapter in this book is my first 10 years in the FBI, the last longest chapter is, uh, is all about my role in the Unibom case. And uh, some of what we're discussing today, of course, there's more in the book. And if you really want to get more stuff about miniseries and the Unibom case, this is an audio book available on Amazon, as well as audible.com. Of course, the book is available on Amazon. And it's a uh, fun romp through, uh, there's eight episodes or eight chapters to it, in which I discuss each episode of the miniseries what really happened, what didn't happen, interactions with the actors, the director. I have interviews with the writer, director, prop people, and set decorator, and some other guest appearances through there. So uh, uh, check that out too, if you are so interested. But let's get into the case itself. And um, by the way, um, I'm retiring from this Unibom presentation at the end of this year. It's been 25 years and about five months now since the arrest of Ted Kaczynski. And, uh, I've probably done this presentation 500 times. There's a three hour version, there's a 10 minute version. You're getting about the 45 minute version. And uh, it's just time to move on. As I tell people, if the answers to your questions are not in my third book, in my recently released audio book or the mini series, you may want to write Ted Kaczynski a letter and ask him because uh, otherwise the questions will probably have been answered. So, um, so yeah, so going ahead with one of my last presentations about the Unibom case, let's start right here. Uh, you can see how far back it started, uh, 1978. I was a rookie police officer in suburban Philadelphia when this all started. But I do remember reading the newspaper and, and reading about some of these events, saying, boy, who is this guy? Uh, why is he sending these bombs? Because no one knew early on. But anyway, Unibom itself, the term is a, an acronym it's a, it's a, it's a, the FBI loves acronyms to name their cases. So it's a combined word standing for representing university and airline bombings. That's because, as you can probably guess, the earliest victims of the Unabomber, the bombs were sent to either professors or left in certain uh, university facilities, or they were sent to airlines themselves or, or the Boeing company, as you'll see. So that's where the word Unabomb comes from. And of course, the bomber himself became known as the Unabomber. So first few uh, bombings here, you can see uh, where they started, Chicago. 
Uh, these were mailed or placed in Chicago. And it's always a clue to, as a, as a behavioralist or a profiler, where a serial offender first offends is usually his comfort zone, his area of familiarity. So the earliest profiles suggested that because of course the bombs were mailed and, and or placed in Chicago or from Chicago, uh, that this person had roots in that city. And of course it was right. Um, and I also add in here that by today's standards with the Unabomber only killing three people and injuring about two dozen, some very seriously, by in comparison to other um, uh, killers and violent offenders, his numbers aren't that high. But what makes him distinctive, if not unique in US criminal justice history is the fact that the case went on for 17 years. We knew we were working with a very bright person, if not a genius. And because we knew this from the end, at near the end when he was writing letters to victims, to uh, media outlets, uh, to law enforcement, and you know, and taunting them in some ways or the other. And we just knew this guy was a brilliant criminal and we could only hope that he would make some mistake somewhere and, uh, and give us a chance to arrest him, which he finally did. But we're getting ahead of ourselves now. So what was interesting to me when I was finally brought on the UTF, Unabom Task Force in 1995, um, was uh, this was the first case, the first bombing that truly interested me. And that's because uh, this was the first time the Unabomber incorporated a written communication of some sort. It was a typed letter that was mailed separately to the president of United Airlines, Percy Wood. And it was like friendly and, hey, I'm one of your fans. I've read about you, whatever. And I know you're president of United Airlines and you have you know, problems with some of your unions, things like that. I think if you read this book I'm going to send you called Ice Brothers, I think it would really uh, it would really help you manage your company better, whatever. So uh, a day or two later, sure enough, in the mail to his house comes a package, carefully wrapped, a lot of stamps on it. Unabomber never went into a post office to mail his uh, his uh, his packages. He always just put like you know thirty five uh, stamps or so on it to make sure it it got through the mail. So Percy Wood opens it up. If you can picture a book. That somehow someone hollowed out the, uh, the the pages, so it looks like a regular book on the outside. But as soon as he opened up, a little spring mechanism was triggered, and it blew up, and uh, he was seriously injured. Fortunately, he lived, but um, but he was seriously injured. So um, this is the fourth Unabom incident, and um, but they didn't stop from there. A year or so later, more universities involved. You see, some of these were mailed, some of these were placed. Uh, they continue uh, varying universities. There's again, Boeing aircraft gets a particular uh, device sent to them. Uh, somehow Berkeley was a favorite target. You'll see there, John Hauser was a graduate student. He, uh, he was actually working on his PhD there in, a, uh, I actually forget the field, engineering or something, but he was, he was a member of NASA and he was scheduled to be a, a pilot on one of the upcoming space shuttle flights. And he was in training for that at the same time he's attending classes at Berkeley. So what happens, he opened the package that was left outside of an office there and it blew most of his hand away and he had to give up his dream of becoming a pilot. It, it, it just wouldn't have worked for him. So uh, one of the uh, earlier uh, victims of the Unabomber who uh, sustained serious injuries. Bombings continue, but this one um, contained the second letter involved in the case. It was mailed to uh, this professor of, um, I think he was a computer scientist uh, at, at University of Michigan. And, um, and he didn't even open it, his uh, graduate assistant did. And uh, it was sent to uh, this person um, with the, under the, uh, the auspices that also with the letter was a copy of the dissertation of this fake student, Ralph Kloppenberg. You can see his name at the bottom of the letter. Of course, there was no dissertation. They opened up the second package, the grad student did. It blew up and seriously injured him. Fortunately, he did not die. So I'll, I'll flash forward now about 10 years and I'm brand new. I was, I was an FBI agent for uh, seven years in New York City. I was promoted to supervisor to the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia, to the profiling unit. 
And I went through a 12 week intense course in all things profiling and behavior and crime scene analysis and et cetera. And um, I go home for a, a week's vacation and I get a call that, um, Jim, they need a profiler in San Francisco at the kind of newly formed Unibom Task Force. Are you interested in going there for 30 days? And I said, 30 days in San Francisco? Well, I, I guess I can do that. Little did I know those 30 days would turn into a year and a half in San Francisco, at least back and forth from there to Quantico. But nonetheless, um, so I come back from vacation and I go through like a day or two intense studying program of everything Unibom. Some of the other profilers there had worked the case. So they give me a bunch of material to take with me to San Francisco. And I'm actually flying out on the plane from Washington, D.C. to San Fran. And I have a three ring binder full of all kinds of materials, uh, including the newly released manifesto. We'll talk about that a bit more later. But I'm going through all these documents that he wrote. And I realized that there was no forensic evidence from any of the bombs or any of the letters, no fingerprints, no indented writing, no um, DNA, even in the early days of that analysis, no blood spatter, I mean, nothing, um, uh, no hairs and fibers. This guy was, it was an evidence-free zone as far as um, the forensic examinations of these, uh, of all this evidence and, and how it went. So, um, but I'm looking at this letter, I read it once and said, all right, some interesting language in here. And then I kind of just put the whole book down in the empty seat next to me. And I'm just kind of staring at it, kind of tired, quite frankly, from four hours of reading Unibomb stuff. And I just glanced at this letter, like almost not so hard, much to read it or comprehend it, but to actually look at it almost like a photograph. And I did. And I just happened to look down the left-hand column, starting with doctor up top, then Ann Arbor, then Deer. And basically, I realized it spelled this sentence. You can see the letters on the left there, straight down. But the sentence is, Dad, it is I. And I was familiar with this concept of acrostics. That's what it, like a hidden message in a letter, usually in a vertical column. It's the first letters of each line or each paragraph. It could be the last letters of each line. Um, they would be send some kind of a, a secret message to someone. It could be innocent. It could be diabolical. Um, uh, Edgar Allan Poe was known for doing this. The uh, poet E.E. E. Cummings was known for doing this. And um, I actually did it in my police officer days. If you read my book about ways to get back at a, a manager who was giving me a hard time. But uh, there are ways to put like secret messages in these things. Not always that easy either, uh, especially with a, uh, uh, you know, an old fashioned typewriter such as this. So um I went out to the task force and basically my first afternoon there, I'm meeting the bosses and talking to people. They don't know me. I'm a brand new profiler. I'm there to help them. The manifesto had just been received by the New York Times. We'll get into that in a bit. And they wanted me up looking at that. And after about 10 minute conversation, I said, by the way, uh, what does anyone here think of the dad is I uh, hidden message in uh, letter number two? And the bosses kind of looked at each other and the other agents. What are you talking about? Yeah, the letter to the University of Michigan professor, dad, it is I, let me see that. And they pulled it out. And over 10 years of it going to the lab and everywhere else, no one else saw this message. And I was quick to point out, I said, look, I'm kind of new at this profiling stuff, although I've always enjoyed reading and, and crossword puzzles and word games. Um, I don't even know exactly what this means, but it's possible that our Unabomber person has parent issues or dad problems or something like that. And maybe this is some kind of a message he's putting out there to him. And they didn't really seem to care of its value or its evidentiary uh, propriety at that time. They put, brought me into the office, put me on a conference call to FBI headquarters, like the deputy director. They got the DOJ involved in Washington, DC. And, um, and all of a sudden I was in the middle of this and I tried to explain all this and they thought that was amazing what I found here. And uh, the big boss out there turned to me and said, Fitz, I like this kind of stuff. You're in charge of all the documents in this case. And we just received a copy of the manifesto. I suggest you start reading that right away. And that's what I did. I spent uh, long days in the San Francisco FBI office uh, reading through the manifesto and the 13 letters that preceded it, including this one to Dr. McConnell. 
Now let's go back to 1985 uh, and uh, finally a victory, so to speak, for the Unabomber. After uh, 11 bombings, he, uh, he finally uh, succeeded in, in killing someone. And that was a uh, Hugh Scrutton outside of his computer store. You'll notice here too, uh, the Unabomber has expanded from um, just airlines and universities. Now he's targeting computer stores. So um, Hugh Scrutton just happened to be the owner of the store. He walked outside. There was a four foot long two by four that the Unabomber had diabolically sort of sliced in half the long way, opened it up. He uh, carved out the wood in the middle, put the bombing device in there with a bunch of tacks and glass and small nails, glued it back together with, uh, de with glue made from deer hooves. And, uh, and that was set in the parking lot. And the way it was set up, once someone moved it after the Unabomber put it down, uh, it would blow up and seriously hurt or kill the person. And this device did kill Hugh Scrutton. So uh, years later, when we arrested the Unabomber and read some of the diaries and journals uh, in his uh, cabin, he had numbers, numerous volumes of each. He was so proud this day when he read in the newspaper that finally one of his bombs led to a death. This was the best thing that could happen to him, he wrote. Sad story, I know. Uh, but the bombings continued. Um, and this one was significant. Fortunately, another computer store. Fortunately, Gary Wright was not killed. He was seriously injured. But what happened here was um, something that made the Unabomber uh, go dark or go underground for the next six years. And that is a witness inside the store saw this man put down the device into the parking lot, which her boss eventually picked up and severely damaged his uh, arms and legs. But she saw enough of this person that the police realized the value she may have. And they brought in a uh, sketch artist. And lo and behold, you may have seen this before, but in um, March or so of 1987, for the first time, the FBI and law enforcement had a clue, had, had some piece of potential evidence as to who the Unabomber might be. And this was it, you're looking at it right now. Not a whole lot to go on, I know, with the, with the big aviator glasses, the hoodie, and it turns out that's actually sort of a fake hair hanging down. He wore a wig, we found out years later. So there wasn't a whole lot to go on, but, uh, but what's important, the fact that this picture went out there and the fact that he was a little bit careless and someone saw him, meaning the Unabomber, uh, it scared him. It scared him enough to uh, stop bombing for the next six years. And um, that always tells us whenever there's a, uh, a serial bank robber, serial rapist, serial killer, if they stop offending for some time, it's always very curious to us profilers, why? What happened? Did they get arrested for some other crime? Did they get killed accidentally or purposely? But we, don't, we didn't associate him with the crimes he was committing. You know what, did he get married? Did he get a new job? Did he have some kids? Some serial offenders actually have a, you know, sort of normal aspect to their lives. And this could at least stop them for a few years. So we had no idea what happened to the Unabomber. And, you know, his, his legacy was sort of drifting away until 1993. Then he came back with a vengeance and he started bombing again. And uh, what was really interesting this time, he obviously had six years to think about how he would do this next. Instead of just sending bombs out in these ruse letters, he, um, he started sending letters to the New York Times, his paper of record, <coughs> excuse me, in an attempt to explain who and what he was and what his group was. So um, here's a copy of that actual, uh, it's the third letter in the Unabom letters uh, order, so to speak the first two being those ruse letters, but this is the first one in which uh, the Unabomber is writing as a group, as an anarchist uh, group calling themselves FC and explaining kind of in very short and uh, pithy language there, just exactly uh, what they're about. Now we were pretty sure, and again, I wasn't involved in the case here yet. This is 93, I'm in the FBI, I'm in New York working bank robberies and kidnappings. 
but not uh, not the Unabom case, not yet anyway. So you notice this letter here and um, the code word was, or code letters were FC. And on the bottom of every one of his IEDs, that's improvised explosive device, also bombs, uh, were the letters FC. So uh, they were incorporated here in this letter, but you'll notice down below, um, there's also a nine digit number, which looks very much like a US social security number, as I'm sure you are aware. So the FBI received this letter from the New York Times, of course, no fingerprints on it, no indented writing, no DNA, nothing, but they do have this number. Now they were convinced that this was not the Unabomber social security number, but maybe somehow it could have some tangential connection or indirect connection to the bomber. So of course they ran it through uh, the system. And uh, this, this number could have come back to anyone, could have been anyone us here on this panel, me, any of you in the audience, your parents, uh, an accountant, a lawyer, a priest, a teacher, uh, an FBI agent, a police officer. It could have come back to anyone like that. It so happens though, it came back to an inmate serving time in the California penal system. He was a low level drug dealer, car thief, a little bit of everything. And somehow for whatever reason, this guy in prison uh, and his actual social security number was the one chosen by the Unabomber as his secret identifying number. So uh, the agents back then checked on this guy. He was in prison during some of the bombings and the mailings of these letters. So there's no way this guy is the Unabomber, but maybe somewhere he crossed paths with this person or he lost his wallet or his card, whatever. So the agents interviewed him for a few hours and tried to explain um, uh, what the deal was about Unibom. He had heard about the Unabomber, but uh, he said offhand, he had no direct knowledge, no friends of his. They actually found his card in the prison, wherever they keep their uh, their personal property in the basement of the prison. He still had a possession of that card. Uh, he never gave it to anyone else. It wasn't used for anyone else that we know or by anyone else. And um, But uh, all he could tell the uh, agents who were interviewing him says, look, agents, I don't know exactly who this Unabomber feller is, but you get me out of prison today, I'll go search him down and I'll find him and uh, I'll, I'll turn him into you. And they said, yeah, well, we thank you for your offer, but here's the deal. You find out who he is, you give us a name, then we'll work on getting you an early prison release, but we can't just release you because of this. So needless to say, he was disappointed, uh, but, uh, uh, but really nothing ever came of this. And after all these years, even after the arrest of Kaczynski, um, we don't know where this number came from or what it represented, but it seems like neither the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski, or one of the same, or this inmate had any connection in real life. So that was another lead that went sort of nowhere, one of many. Um, David Gelertner uh, was, and actually still is, a professor of computer science at Yale. And uh, he was one of the early, well, I should say, he was one of the victims of the Unabomber, not that early. Uh, this was in 93, I believe, or 94. But uh, first he received a device from him. He opened it up and it blew half of the professor's uh, hand off and seriously damaged a part of his arm. Uh, and then about two or three months later, after receiving the IED in the mail, the, um, he received this letter in the mail and this envelope. And uh, it's addressed to him at uh, the proper address. And you'll notice up in the upper left-hand corner, the return address. Um, well, this is a, um, an example of Unabomber humor because um, that actually happens to be the real address of FBI headquarters in Washington, DC. So um, of course it was no secret at this point that the FBI was the lead agency investigating the Unabom case. So that somehow the Unabomber felt it was funny to send this poor victim a snarky letter, as you'll see in a minute, and also tied into FBI headquarters. Another letter, he also said the FBI is a joke. Um, well, he wasn't laughing too hard just a few years later when he was arrested, but that's for another time, another place. So here's that letter. Look at it for a minute. I take a drink of water here. You notice I said water just now and not water. If you watched Manhunt Unabomber, 
You'll know that was a pivotal scene early on where the Fitz character says something about, you know, uh, getting a drink of water. And uh, I think it was even that inmate that we just were talking about in the, in the series. Uh, he picked up water. Who says water? You mean water, right? And my FBI friends are making fun of me in the series about uh, Fitz's pronunciation of that, of H2O. Well, uh, in real life, that actually happened. Uh, born and raised in Philadelphia, you may pick up some of my dialect features from there. But I grew up mostly like most of the millions of people that live geographically around me saying uh, the word is water. And uh, that's just the Philadelphia pronunciation. And just like we say hoagies instead of subs, and there's a whole separate course I teach in this stuff for forensic linguistics. But, uh, but uh, that actually was an eye-opening moment to me. And you know what? Language does mean something. It does, it does give clues as to who we are, where we're from, maybe our educational level, maybe our intelligence level, our, our uh, IQ, things like that. And, um, and that's what first turned me on to, you know what? We had no other evidence in this Unabomb case. I'm out here now on the task force. Let me really focus on these documents and I may just find something I want. And this is the letter that's slowly turned me around and defied some of the existing profiles of the Unabomber, which were done before I got there. And you don't have to read the whole letter, but I want you to read the first sentence. People without advanced degrees aren't as smart as they think they are. Okay, think about that. So does the author, if this is a legitimate letter, someone who has legitimate complaints to Galertner or someone else, if when you read this, just this first line alone, you would probably automatically assume that the author does not in fact have an advanced degree. It's sort of a negated form of indicating that you, know, you the author, uh, are the one without the advanced degree, but perhaps you're even smarter than the one who has the advanced degree. Okay, I, I get that from, a, from the perspective of what the author is trying to create here. Then read down to the next paragraph about in the middle, Apparently, people without a college degree don't count. Okay, so now it's not just advanced degree people aren't smart, as they think they are, but then apparently people without college degrees don't count. So that's now telling the reader, perhaps an innocent reader, not knowing the context of where all this is being found in the Unibom case, that, all right, well, I guess the author doesn't have a, a college degree either maybe one year, maybe two years, maybe he's a high school dropout, who knows? But that's the impression that the author wants you to to believe. And some of my colleagues in the FBI were convinced that the Unabomber meant this literally. And I started looking at this, I'm looking at some other letters where he claimed to be working uh, a Monday through Friday job, nine to five, although he does it in negated form, that he was getting tired of practicing his bombs, you know, detonating his bomb practice runs after work and on weekends, at night after work and on weekends in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Okay, so then it started hitting me. Why is this guy who is so clever, so smart, not leaving any evidence, no physical or forensic evidence at all on his devices or on his letters? Why is he now supplying us with potentially autobiographical information. I know it's not much, it's not a name and an address, but when the entire um, United States population is a suspect in a case, certainly adult men will say, uh, because almost all bombers are men, um, even just narrowing it down a little bit by saying, all right, no advanced degree, no college degree, no, no, no. Now, this is a contraindicator, not indicator, and I coined that term. I didn't make up that word, but I brought that into forensic linguistic analysis. It's an indication against the truth in so many words. It's a, against indications. And I said, no, no, we're now going to switch this profile. This guy not only has a college degree, he has an advanced degree. I'm not sure master's, PhD, or ABD, all but dissertation, but this guy is more educated than we think he is. Uh, or one that, that we earlier thought he was. And uh, and certainly by the time we read the manifesto with some of the concepts he was discussing there and even the format of the manifesto, like an old time, like a 40s, 1940s or 50s dissertation, uh, we realized this guy definitely had a few degrees and he was not what he's trying to pretend to be 
in this letter. He, you know, he did not live near the Sierra Nevada mountains and he didn't have a daytime job like most people do. Again, not real big clues in the grand scheme of things, but anything to strengthen that profile. So when other suspects do come up, we can point at them and go, aha, this is the person we should be prioritizing right now. So um, again, this is what you can do with forensic linguistics. Um, and of course, forensic means arguing the law and linguistics is a scientific study of language. And you combine those two things. I wasn't a forensic linguistic when I, a forensic linguist, when I started, uh, when I was first assigned to the Unabom task force, I eventually went back to school and got a second master's in that field. But, uh, but I was still applying the principles of that field along the way, even if I didn't really know it at the time. So as you can see here, two more bombings in late 94 and early 95, they were both successful as the Unabomber would see it. Uh, the, uh, the executive in North, Northern New Jersey. And, the, and after that bombing, there was a really a lot of uh, no, notoriety and uh, media headlines. The internet was in its very earliest days here, but uh, some information going out again, the composite sketch went out again. They had pictures of what the packages looked like. They were wrapped in brown paper, hand printed addresses, fake return addresses, all these stamps put on it. And a lot of publicity was out there. So in April of 1995, when Gilbert Murray walked into his office that day and his secretary said, oh, hello, sir, you have a package. It's over there on the chair. He picks it up, looks around the, with a few of his uh, employees and said, wow, this looks like one of those packages from the Unabomber. And he laughed and they kind of laughed or not, who knows. He walked in his office, a few minutes later, he opens it up and guess what? The last opinion he ever had the last joke he ever tried to tell proved to be very, very accurate and deadly. And he, uh, he was killed as a result of this package exploding in his arms. So um, these were the, th the second and third deaths of the Unabomber. And as we found out later in his writings, he was uh, very, very happy when these occurred. But he wasn't, uh, he wasn't sitting idle. He had some of plans up his sleeve. And that is, he wanted the New York Times, he wrote some other letters to the New York Times and he said, I have this article I want you to publish. Uh, you publish this article and I will cease and desist from bombing forever for purposes of killing people. However, I will keep bombing for purposes of sabotage. How exactly that was gonna work out, I'm not, I'm not sure, but he did swear, uh, or at least he wrote in his letter to the New York Times, Publish this thing, and um, and I will stop bombing to kill people. So a big debate. Uh, when they published, uh, we got the copy of the letter. Of course, no fingerprints, no DNA, no evidence. Uh, but we now had a, a copy of the manifesto, and uh, it was all the same typewriters used from the Percy Wood letter, the Dr. McConnell letter, everything else to Galant or New York Times. All the same 1932 Smith Corona manual typewriter. As you're gonna learn, the Unabomber was against modern technology. Everything that happened after the industrial revolution in the 1700s, to him, that was bad. And we'll focus on that in a minute. But uh, now I'm out at the Unabomb task force. It's uh, June, July of 95. And we have to make a decision at the task force itself. Do we think this thing should be published or not? So here's the theme of it. Um, but of course, he wrote there in the middle of it that un unfortunately he had to um, he had to kill people to get his point across. And I've been asked over the years, even in a recent time with the 25th anniversary, was the Unabomber right in some of the things he wrote? And I've said from day one, yeah, he brings up some interesting points, some interesting aspects of our society and our culture, and and where maybe in some ways it's gone wrong. And we see now with big tech how all the control they have, right, wrong, well. Maybe the Unabomber's onto something, but he never should have. Uh, if he didn't kill people, maybe he'd be out there someday, uh, and, and, and including right now, as some sort of a prominent speaker, philosopher, you know, getting his points across. But uh, the fact that he killed people, it just uh, it negated a lot of uh, a lot of his ideas. So again, um, it was debated over the uh, next few months. 
on, in public and private. I was one of the first person. I was very familiar with his writings. I said, we got to get this out there. We got to get this thing published. I don't like giving in the, to the demands of a terrorist either. It's kind of what he was. Uh, and I know it may cause some copycat people to come in, but I am convinced we have no other leads. We have no other breaks in this case. It's going to require the language in this case to blow this thing wide open and finally identify it. Someone will read this. It'll be a former professor, a former student, a teacher, a, a lawyer, a spouse, a family member, a friend, something will see the language in this and, and give us a call. And hopefully at that point, we can then build our case after that, identify the Unabomber and, uh, and, and arrest him. Well, uh, it didn't happen right away. Um, this, was, uh, this was an actual folded up newspaper, eight pages um, long, no ads or anything on it. It's because uh, the original, the manifesto itself was 56 single spaced typewritten pages, um, 35,000 words, 212 paragraphs, and about uh, 28 notes at the very end. So um, and it was very much, each paragraph, by the way, was numbered, which made it easier for reference purposes for us who were focused on reading every word of this thing and referencing it back and forth when we had to compare it to other writings, et cetera. So um, yeah, it was a, a very interesting uh, time frame. We were hoping somebody would recognize it and they eventually did, but it took about six months after the publication in the Washington Post. If you watch the miniseries Manhunt Unabomber, there's a scene, I forget, uh, maybe um, episode seven or so, but uh, the manifesto was published and, um, and, uh, and the FBI has a surveillance on the one store in San Francisco, which sells the Washington Post. And we, the FBI requested the Washington Post to be the one that printed this, as opposed to the New York Times, because first of all, the Unabomber permitted the Washington Post to do it. Uh, but second of all, the Washington Post was only sold in two different stores all throughout the San Francisco Bay Area. It's not like today with the internet and you can read the newspaper, you know, anytime you want, or it's not even called newspaper anymore, but the media accounts. But back then, the New York Times was sold in like two dozen stores. And we were convinced that the Unabomber would want a trophy uh, of some sort or a souvenir uh, of his work. And we would thought he'd be one of the people lining up so it was to buy it. So it was well advertised that it was coming out September 19th. And we put surveillance teams, several hundred FBI agents and, uh, and, and surveillance people sat on these two stores. And we followed every single person who bought a copy of it and uh, followed them to their home, copied down their tag uh, to their business, wherever. Um, but all of them turned out to be a wash. Not one of them was the Unabomber. If the Unabomber got a copy of the manifesto, it wasn't that day in San Francisco. We, uh, we all unfortunately concluded. So I worked uh, there until December, following through some leads. People did call up, oh, I think it's my brother. I, uh, not my brother, no one said that yet. Uh, I think it's my ex-husband. I think it's my attorney. Uh, all, all the suspects you can imagine that were uh, called in and we checked out every single one. And really by the end of uh, 2000, I'm sorry, by the end of 1995, the FBI had about 2,500 suspects, some named, some described, and some very, you know, very amorphous, but we were looking at people and, and trying to figure out, but none of them turned out to be the actual Unabomber. So by December of that year, my bosses in Quantico wanted me back to work regular serial rape and serial homicide cases. So, uh, so I was called back and, I, I, and there I, I went, but, my, um, but the UTF folks would still send me information. They send me writings of suspects. I would look at them, I would compare them to the manifesto. And uh, I said each time, no, nope, not the guy. No, nope, not the guy. Yeah, sure, put a surveillance on him, but I don't think he's the guy. However, um, in February of 96, I get a fax, 23 pages long, a brief phone call. Fitz, uh, we have a new document we want you to look at. Oh, okay, well, who's this one from? Yeah, we're not gonna tell you this time. Just look at it, compare it to your copy of the manifesto, which I had all marked up with various colors and highlighters, and, uh, and let us know what you think. Uh, sure, okay. So I looked at this 23-page document, and um, 
I started reading it and I couldn't believe my eyes uh, in that it was basically an outline of the manifesto. It's almost like a Cliff's Notes, uh, you know, a shortened version of a novel or a book. Um, instead of the manifesto though, it was this 23 page document, which I was told was from 1972. And uh, I asked who was it from, they wouldn't tell me. But what was interesting, even the points that were made in it followed the same order as the manifesto. So whoever wrote the manifesto clearly used this outline to help him put it together. And after spending about three hours and marking it up every which way I could, I finally called back the people at the UTF and I told them quite frankly, I said, either this is an elaborate plagiarism, that is someone got the Washington Post version of the manifesto, sat down with an old typewriter and just typed some bullet points, you know, from each, each page or every 10th chapter or something like that, or every 10th paragraph and, uh, and put it on old paper and wh whatever, or you've got your man. They're the exact words I used. And uh, the boss is out there on the conference call said, uh, Fitz, we know it's not a plagiarism. Uh, if you think we've got our man, then you're coming back to San Francisco to finish this case. I said, who is it? We're not gonna tell you. They put nothing over the phone or even in the early FBI email system. I had to fly all the way out there four days later. And when the agent picked me up in the car, she told me it was this guy right here you're looking at living in a cabin in the middle of uh, uh, on, a, on a hilltop in Montana. And he's been there off the grid for like 20, some year, 25 years on and off. No water, no electricity. I said, how did this come about? So, well, his brother is a guy named David Kaczynski. His wife actually read it uh, on the computer of all things on the FBI.gov website, which we just started like in the early, uh, in early 1995 or so. So they happened to, she happened to read it there while in France and said, boy, I've never met my brother-in-law, Ted, but I've read some letters he's written my husband and he's all about the evils of technology and big government and big business, <clears throat> excuse me, big business. Uh, I better tell David when I get home. So she gets home to David and hey, Dave, uh, husband, yeah, great to be home. You may wanna read this manifesto thing. Boy, it sounds like your brother, Ted. And he just laughed. He said, my brother, Ted, wouldn't hurt a fly. He, him, the Unabomber, but it took him a month or two to finally look at it, read it, recognize some of the language. One of the key terms he used within it was the term cool-headed logician. Um, and that's a term the only who's Ted, his brother Ted used and no one else. And that's when he decided to contact the lawyer. And eventually by February of 95, the lawyer contacted the FBI saying, yeah, I have a client who thinks his brother may be the Unabomber. Next thing you know, we got in touch with the Kaczynski family. And luckily they were both, the mother and the brother were both pack rats. That is they saved every document Ted ever mailed them, every letter, postcard, you name it. And at the end, we had 178 different uh, uh, communications, writings of Ted Kaczynski, including his, uh, his University of Michigan dissertation in mathematics, uh, letters to, uh, to David, to his mother. And that's what you're looking for. That's what you're looking at in this picture here. One of the first days uh, of the, uh, the, 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 me being put in charge of all the documents in this case, basically comparing the 178 writings of Ted Kaczynski to the 14 writings, if you will, the letters and the manifesto of the Unabomber. And uh, I had a master's in psychology at this point, but not linguistics. And I was a bit nervous and I wasn't sure if I was out of my league, but my bosses kept reminding me, uh, no one knows the Unabomber's writings better than you, Fitz. So we think you're the one to put in charge of this. I was. I was working 12 hour days, my first shift there. This went to about uh, 15 hour days now. But our plan was to build the evidence to put this case together to arrest Ted Kaczynski by the middle of uh, May of that year, 96. Uh, here's another part of my team. You look in the back there, there you'll see a picture of the Unabomber just waiting uh, to be arrested. But um, it wasn't that easy. And especially because um, 
yeah, so just let me just back up here. And here are some of the spellings we found in the manifesto. On the left side is how the, uh, both Ted Kaczynski and the Unabom are spelled words. So you'll see the top two words are British spellings as opposed to the US spellings on the right. Uh, beneath that, willfully an installment. Believe it or not, they're alternate spellings. Neither one is a misspelling. You have a choice of spelling it either way. Kaczynski liked to write, and the Unabomber liked to just use one L in those two words there. So these are some of the uh, uh, linguistic features and spelling features we were picking up early on. Even not just the words themselves, but the topics that he was using. So here the T docs are for the Ted Kaczynski docs. The U docs are the Unabom docs. And you can see in almost consistent descending order, uh, what topics were important to Ted Kaczynski and what topics were important to the Unabomber. And you can see society was at the very uh, top of that list with power and you can read you know, what's going on from there. There's actually a second screen. There's like 14 different topics I isolated that were both very important and they're eclectic topics when you think of it. They don't all go together. Some do of course, but not all of them. And, um, and we have the odds of having not just very similar sentences and clauses and phrases and words, you know, uh, between the two sets of writings, but also the, even the topics themselves. So we found that very interesting and I was slowly building our case, maybe not for an arrest warrant, <coughs> but hopefully for a search warrant, because there's less probable cause needed to search someone's house than it is to physically take them into custody. So I was working with an assistant U.S. attorney, a prosecutor in this case. It was in the same building in San Francisco. He really liked the work my team and I was doing, um, but there was just we weren't finding any one thing that he could just he just go you know um, grab onto and say aha this is the linguistic smoking gun the probable cause we're looking for. And other investigators are doing other things, trying to piece together Kaczynski's travels, whatever. There was no real strong evidence there either. But finally, one afternoon, I, uh, I reread the manifesto and I remember paragraph 185 had this particular uh, uh, sentence. And this was actually a standalone paragraph. You can see it, the, uh, the final part of it there, you can eat your cake and have it too. And I thought about that. I remember I read it the first time and didn't even notice it. But by the second time, the next day or so, I said, wait a minute, the Unabomber transposed the verbs in this sentence. We all say you can't have your cake and eat it too. That's interesting. Um, I finally found a mistake in the Unabomber's writings besides a very simple, simple typo that he just crossed out. But it, you know, that's how everyone else says it. you can't have your cake and eat it too. And there was no real internet back then to do searches about this kind of stuff. But I went to a few uh, bookstores and reference libraries. I know there's a few old songs from the Four Seasons in which they sing, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Uh, Bob Dylan and Lay Lady Lay, uh, you can't have your cake and eat it too. A few other songs. And I said, but this guy has it wrong. Boy, if we can only find this particular um, proverb or axiom in some writings of someone out there, this will be that linguistic smoking gun we're looking for. So we're going through the uh, T documents one at a time. I finally get the document P-137. It was a letter written in the early 70s by Theodore J. Kaczynski, which luckily the mother saved. And uh, sure enough, at the very end of that letter, look what we have. So again, it's anti-technology. And there it is, we can't eat our cake and have it too. The ironic part was he actually had it right. In early modern English, whoever, I think the, in the early 1500s, someone wrote this, you know, uh, some peer of uh, William Shakespeare or someone wrote this. And as you, you know, you, you can't eat your cake and have it too. Somewhere in the US in the early 20th century, someone switched the verbs and that's how we all wound up saying it. But this was the clue that we needed. Shakespeare aside, it didn't matter. We now have this highly idiosyncratic uh, proverb with verbs transposed in the Unabomber's manifesto as well as in the writings of Ted Kaczynski. The prosecutor saw this, said, I think we have the probable cause we need. And next thing you know, uh, I put together a 50-page affidavit. Here's just one page of it. 
It's online if you want to check under my website, jamesrfitzgerald.com. A lot of stuff we're talking about today, pictures and scripts from the, the, the mini series and all are on my website. Check it out, ways to order my books, all that stuff. But, uh, but this is also there and this is 50 pages long and uh, I, don't, I don't render an opinion at all in it. I just put side by side comparisons of what the Unabomber wrote uh, on the right side and what Ted wrote on the left. The judge saw it and for the first time ever in, uh, in US courts, forensic linguistic evidence in a criminal case anyway, was authorized to be used for a search warrant. The judge signed the search warrant. They went into the cabin. In Montana, there was a treasure trove of evidence found there, bomb making materials, a handwritten copy of the manifesto, all kinds of other uh, related items to Kaczynski. And uh, he was placed under arrest. Uh, about a week or so later, the attorneys, of course, dressed him up. That's him going into the courtroom. And uh, it took about a year and a half back and forth legal machinations of, uh, you know, whether he would plead guilty or not or uh, ask for a trial. Um, uh, a few academics got involved and they were uh, the defense hired a linguist, a uh, very well known linguist, I, I later found out, named Robin Lakoff. Uh, and she disputed my findings in the manifesto. The prosecution, our side, hired another um, English professor. And he was kind of battling with her. It was very interesting, the two academics going back and forth. But eventually the judge said, all the evidence in this case, uh, including Fitzgerald's affidavit, is allowed to be uh, uh, allowed to be used in court by the prosecution. So all the evidence found in the cabin will stand. And uh, the, real, the defense realized they had no case at that point. And they decided to uh, plead him guilty. Reluctantly, Kaczynski pleaded guilty and eventually uh, he was found competent to stand trial. That was important to him. Excuse me. And he was sentenced to the Supermax Penitentiary in Florence, Colorado uh, for the rest of his life, uh, two life sentences. He'll never see the light of day again. He's in solitary confinement there as is, are, are all the inmates, 23 hours a day in his cell. He gets out one hour to exercise, take a shower, then he goes back in. Remember the, that time frame. I'll bring that up again before I leave you here. Meaning uh, how often he's in the cell and, and uh, 23 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 a year. <clears throat> so um, some other cases involving forensic linguistics. I have separate presentations on all of these and they're uh, in my books too, or they will be in a forthcoming book. Um, I'm gonna move on now, kind of walking you through um, my life, uh, starting with Unibom. I wound up getting my uh, master's in linguistics at Georgetown. And then these are three cases I worked later in my career and even in uh, retirement. And I'll give a trigger warning here. Um, these are about staged suicide incidents. Uh, there weren't actually no suicides. The killers tried to make it look like the person committed suicide, but they didn't. But if this is something that's troubling or, or uh, problematic, and if you wanna shut off the volume or whatever, I, I understand. So, um, but um, you'll see exactly what I mean. And uh, we may just get have time for two cases here. I wanna make sure plenty of time for Q and A. But before we get into the cases themselves, just a few uh, word slides here. I wanna to explain to you uh, what is authorial attribution analysis. And this is, um, this is linguistic uh, evidence that is permissible to be testified to in court. I've testified about a dozen times now as an expert uh, in the area of forensic linguistics. Believe it or not, like a polygraph exam results, profiling or, or a profile is not admissible in court. And I really don't disagree with that. It's, it's a great tool to help investigators further identify a subset of suspects and then build their evidentiary case from that point on. And same with linguistic profiling. I'm asked many times to look at anonymous writings, emails, blogs, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Facebook entry, whatever, and say, hey, you know, if it's anonymous, of course, who wrote this? Older, younger, man, woman, um, uh, native English speaker, not uh, educated, not educated, you know, anything about them possible. And I, I can, if I have enough linguistic evidence, I can render an opinion. However, that still won't be, uh, that is not 
uh, uh, allowed to be testified to in court. But what I'm about to show you is, and I would have testified to this in the Unabom case if, in fact, he went to trial. So basically, what we're doing here is we're looking at um, you have some anonymous communications, whatever they may be, and you they may be a, a business or or police or someone come up with one or more suspects, and they get known writings of that person. And the, the forensic linguist job then is to look at the question or su suspected communications and compare them to the known writings, just like I did in Unibom, and compare them and see if you can detail, develop an opinion as to common authorship. So we're not gonna spend too much time here, but what are we looking for? It's a content analysis perspective, stylistic analysis perspective. These are what a forensic linguist looks for. So it's the semantic makeup of the, of the language involved, the structure, the, the syntactical, syntactical uh, meaning contained therein and formatting. And then of course, other issues like what kind of pen or font is being used, what's the margin like, the spacing, the punctuation, all of which I've used on the screen to help solve cases. Some of these bullet points here are what I testify to when I'm first beginning my testimony to a judge or a jury who are not linguists. They don't know about the science of language. And um, I like to focus on the word idiolect. You'll see there the number two bullet point. Uh, that is a linguistic term I learned in my studies of, uh, of a personal dialect. We all have one. You may have picked up my little Southeastern Pennsylvania features. New Yorkers have them. Bostonians have them. The Deep South. African Americans have features, and then the northern cities, Wisconsin, Minnesota. Uh, the West has some uh, with some of the the, uh, the Valley Girl talk and the Surfer Dude talk and Spanglish, but it's a little it's less it's less geographical out west where you live, or at least going to school, than we have on the East Coast, which was the original area that uh, uh, when people immigrated to this country where they. Uh, landed and where they stayed. So that helps us, again, not only in spoken language, but some of these references are also in written language. Three models, just to show you, don't worry about each one here, but it goes back to at least 1966 that people were looking at the comparison of documents for a common authorship. And again, uh, linguists can look at these things from a variation within the norm. So these aren't mistakes or misspellings. These are just choices we all have when we speak, uh, active versus passive voice, uh, uh, again, spelling, sentence construction, you know, subject, uh, verb, object, or, or, you know, do you skip the object in some sentences? You get all these factors uh, that kick in that can help a linguist compare two, sense, two sets of communications, the known and the unknown. Deviation from the norm is in fact, um, other mistakes found therein violation of grammar rules, et cetera, that can help the linguist uh, make a determination too, if it's common authorship. Obviously common misspellings like there, there, and there, you know, the three ways those words are spelled or two, two, and two. Issues like that don't make that much of a difference for a forensic linguist, but, uh, but uh, and the other more distinctive ones and more idiosyncratic ones can of course make a big difference, especially if they're repeated numerous times in both sets of communications. Qualitatively and quantitatively, we, we can also do searches in databases and corpora online, looking obviously within the documents themselves. Uh, so there's different ways we as forensic linguists approach this process. <clears throat> we never sit in a courtroom where I don't write a report saying Joe Smith wrote those five anonymous documents. We wouldn't say that. We would say, this is not DNA or fingerprints, and I'm the first person to acknowledge that. Uh, it's not the same statistical uh, finding that you would have in one of those areas. However, we would say the writing style between the known docs and the Q docs is consistent. And then we would take it, or maybe not consistent or no decision, <clears throat> and then we take it to the next level and say, what is the, how, how distinctive art is it? So if it's exceptionally distinctive, I don't usually put a number to it, but if asked, that goes up in like the 95 percentile, that most likely this is your author, no ands, ifs, or buts. <clears throat> Paul Mick, I'll let you read that for a few seconds. That's an acronym that I developed. You can read the rest of the words that go underneath it there. 
and the, the few of the cases coming up, you'll see, it's basically just like the, 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 the full title describes, it's a, it's a communication of some sort, could be an email, could be a letter, uh, a, a posting of some sort that the criminal undertakes many times after, but sometimes before, before or during to misdirect the investigation, to make the crime look like something it's really not. And uh, it almost always happens as you see there, the letter or email was received by the media or some law enforcement agency or a lawyer. And it's almost always written by the suspect, him or herself, or the significant other of that person, but it's almost always the suspect. Here are some cases I provided expert testimony, not too important here. But let's go into this first case. Um, and uh, these are real cases and uh, 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 I worked as a forensic linguist. I'm gonna go through them quickly, at least two of them, and then uh, we'll follow up with a little, little happier part at the end. So this young 22 year old woman was a mother of a five year old, broke up from her boyfriend and uh, living by her, just the two of them living in an apartment in Reading, Pennsylvania. Uh, her family members get this email one day and it doesn't look like her style, what she would do. They called her, uh, no response, emailed her back, no response, knocked on the door of her apartment, no response. They get the manager, the police, they go inside. She and the little girl are dead, murdered, smothered and strangled to death. The state police are involved investigating this. A few months later, they contact me and say uh, at, in Quantico and say, Agent Fitzgerald, we know you're a profiler. We have this maybe suicide type email. Could you look at it and render a behavioral decision if it's really a suicide email or communication or not? And I said, you know, I could do that. There's been research done in that field, but you know, I'm also a forensic linguist. And if you tell me if both the victim and any of your suspects, you know, you have any known writing from them, um, let's, let me look at it that way and see if we can piece this together. Oh yeah, we have a bunch of emails from each of them. Okay, send them to me. So we had about 400 documents each from these people. And that is the, the, the deceased, uh, Lucy Liz Diaz, and the suspect, Albert uh, Perez, the former boyfriend and the father of the child. So we'll just say the round number is 400 for each. You can see there. So as a reminder, look at the points of ellipsis that I have circled there. If you look at um, Q1, seven dots, Perez, the suspect, in a hundred and... Uh, in uh, 119 different documents, he uses points of ellipsis 6.7 times was the mean count. The Diaz, the victim, did it once with 30 dots. So that's a pretty strong uh, piece of evidence right there, uh, and I, which of course I put in my report. Let's go back again, look at Ghana at the end, an informal contraction. We all use that word in speaking or sometimes written language. Um, Ghana was used uh, by Perez 30 times in his known emails. Diaz used a very similar informal contraction, but look how she spelled it. It was Ghana for her, and she never varied from that. He never varied from Ghana with the O. She never varied from Ghana with the U at 35 times. Another strong piece of evidence of the linguistic variety. Lastly here, a bunch of other things too. These are the highlights. You can see piece three out there in the lower left. And by the way, don't worry about the three. And you'll notice some very odd spellings. We realized this guy was using gloves. It was the winter time in Pennsylvania and he was using gloves when he typed this. This was a shared email account. You don't hear this happening too much anymore, but the uh, boyfriend and girlfriend, uh, whatever they were, they shared the uh, same email account same password. So that's how he could get on her email account and send this bogus pretend um, fake suicide letter to his uh, to her family. But anyway, peace out, focus on that for now. And uh, don't worry about that. She never used the word peace or peace out at all. That is the victim. He did three separate times, peace out twice and peace another time, as if to say goodbye at the end of an email, just like he did uh, in that email. So this really helped us put this case together. Uh, this guy was pleading innocent all along. The linguistics changed it all around. I pointed out the consistencies of his writing style 
to that Q email and the inconsistencies of her writing style to the email. I testified in his court case and he was um, um, found guilty of, uh, of two homicides and he is now serving life imprisonment in Pennsylvania. Real quick, the next case here, we're gonna go through these really quick. This is a case of a black widow. You may have heard that term uh, because the black widow, the female kills its mates. Well, uh, that's what happens when a woman kills her husbands. So this woman had two dead husbands. Uh, long story short, the police got a little bit suspicious and started interviewing people. So this woman got really scared and said, I have to come up with an idea uh, to get out of me being the prime suspect in killing my first husband and my second husband. I know I will poison my biological daughter and I'll write a fake suicide note that not only is she killing herself, but that she poisoned her biological father and her stepfather at like 11 and 15 years of age. Hard to believe, but that's actually what happened. Here's a summary of that, of the first husband, the second husband. Um, um, in 2007, one night, uh, uh, the mother fed her daughter some drinks and even though it tasted awful, she kept almost forcing her daughter to uh, drink it. The daughter passed out, her little sister found her with a note next to her, luckily, uh, the ambulance came, um, she was saved, her life was saved. The detective interviews her in a hospital. Why did you try to kill yourself? I didn't try to kill myself. My mom made this drink. Well, what about this letter? I didn't write this letter. So here's the letter I was telling you about. You may have seen it before. Uh, it has no punctuation in it at all. No, a couple apostrophes, no periods, commas, nothing. It may be a little trickier to uh, read, but just in, just in, in summary here real quick, um, a couple of things we noticed, I noticed right away when I was brought into this case, and that is four times throughout this letter, the word antifree is used. And here are the quote. Now, you know, the substance you put in your radiator in the wintertime to keep your, it from freezing, uh, it's pronounced antifreeze, and it's spelled with a Z-E at the end. Well, for some reason, the author of that letter wrote it as antifree, and guess what? When she was interviewed by the detective, this is the mother, she pronounced it anti-free without the Z or the S sound at the end. And they found that highly odd, as so did I as a linguist. And yes, you can, a linguist can compare spoken language to written language, certainly in terms of its pronunciation or some kind of an odd usage or spelling. But also she did something unusual on line 21. This is completely separate. That should read, but I did it in the yellow part. Um, <clears throat> somehow this person confused the third person singular pronoun, it, with the first person um, uh, singular pronoun, I. And all right, by itself, maybe not that big of a deal, but here's a letter that the suspect wrote from prison to her friend Lynn where she does the exact same thing again. And she's a native English speaker. This is a part of her idiolect. I used that word earlier and defined it. This is a part of her idiolect that somehow in this case gave her away. And, and uh, this was brought up to the jury, even though the defense hired their own linguist to explain this away and claim the daughter wrote the suicide note. Uh, my, uh, I provided information that the mother wrote it, the jury believed it, and no one has any doubt that the mother was in fact guilty of killing two husbands and in fact um, um, uh, trying to kill her daughter. So again, just like I did in the other case, the writing style was consistent with the mother, not consistent with the writings of Ashley Wallace, which I also examined. And uh, she just died in prison about two years ago. So uh, she never saw the light of day again. We're gonna go, we're not gonna skip this case. Um, Let's end with a little bit of a happier type of tone and a little bit about my career. We mentioned the mini series. There's me at the premiere in Los Angeles with, uh, with uh, Sam Worthington, nice guy. He uh, hasn't been seen since because he's busy on the sequel to Avatar. Uh, that's Paul Bettany who portrayed Ed Kaczynski. There's me giving him acting lessons. I'm only kidding. He's a very good actor. Uh, that's my partner, Natalie Schilling next to me. I uh, uh, had a very good conversation, but look behind you there. That's the Hollywood version of the Unabomber's cabin. 
they did wonders in making that cabin. Even the little piece of wood up there you see and the roof how it's a little like ripped. Um, so let me show you some pictures. This is me at the real cabin in 1996, okay? That's the real cabin, that's the real fence. Uh, this is a real picture from the inside of the real cabin. Now there's uh, my partner, Natalie. He's not the Unabomber, but uh, look at the, what the, uh, the, uh, the prop people did and the set decorator for the real cabin. Again, here's the inside of the real one. Look what they did here. It's, it's truly amazing. Uh, here's the real cabin. Notice the tied box. And there's some kind of a canteen or something with the yellow and black stripe. Uh, well, here's the next picture. There's the tied box. There's that canteen. There's a white bucket underneath there. It's amazing what they could do. So if you get a chance to check out the series. They did an excellent job in, in putting this cabin together. And uh, I don't think anyone could top that. It's one of the rare times in life I could walk back or I felt like I was actually truly walking back in time. So there's the actor who portrayed Natalie in the series. There's the two Natalies together at the premiere. And uh, we had some fun with that. So uh, real quick, uh, ending up here, I was a uh, technical advisor for this TV show. You don't believe me? I couldn't make that up, right? Uh, there's me with the Garcia character with some of my friends. Uh, there's me with uh, Jeannie Triplehorn who portrayed uh, Professor or Dr. Alex Blake in seasons nine and 10. There's me with, what's his name again? Uh, oh yeah, Shamar. And I'll tell you, nice guy, uh, but you turn your back on him for a minute and, he, uh, and uh, you can see what happens. So, uh, so um, the folks at Criminal Minds are really good to me. Of course, they paid me for when I worked there. They flew me out to that party. They also gave me a bike and not just any bike. It's a real Criminal Minds bike. And I rode it around my little beach town and people would stop me. Where'd you get that bike? I said, you got to work for the show, pal. And speaking of the show, around a little bit over here and I see Pat back on and I know it's time for Q&A. Thank you for your time. And I'm around for a little bit longer. Let's, uh, let's do uh, some questions and answers. Okay, thank you, James. That was so interesting. We have a few questions. Uh, the first one is uh, criminal profiling. I read has been around since the 1880s. Uh, it was used, probably not like how you do it, but it was used in the Jack the Ripper case. Have you worked with other famous criminal profilers like uh, Robert Ressler, uh, Roy Hazelwood, John Douglas? There's quite a few of them now. Yeah, you could probably say uh, Sherlock Holmes, who of course was a fictional character, may have been the first profiler with his deductive reasoning, et cetera. So if you haven't read the Sherlock Holmes, uh, I think four novels and a number of short stories, they're fun. Even though they're you know, 150 years ago, you can learn a lot from them actually, and I, I did. Um, there was a famous, uh, he wasn't really a profiler, but I, I think he was a professor of something in New York City had worked the George Metesky case, and he was a serial bomber in New York. And he actually uh, pieced together uh, what this bomber was like, and that he was probably worked for utility company and white male and this age bracket, this education. And when you arrest him, he'll be wearing a suit and tie. And the police went to his door finally with other evidence. They arrested him. He was wearing a dark suit and tie. Um, I never worked with uh, Robert Ressler, who's now deceased. I did work with Roy Hazelwood, who is deceased. John Douglas is still with us. Uh, I did work with him. He sort of passed the torch to me when I went through the uh, 12 weeks of training in uh, through April of June of 95, uh, of profiling training at Quantico. He was just about ready to retire. He mentioned the Unibom case to our group. Never did I know he was, or never did I, or I didn't know back then that he was essentially passing the torch to me on the Unibom case. And, uh, and I then took it to the next level and, uh, and, and worked it from there. And within nine months we had it solved. So yes, uh, I did know Roy Hazelwood uh, well, and I, did, I do know John uh, Douglas well, and his show is a good, the show based on his life, Mindhunter, is now they've had, now had two seasons of it. That's a worthwhile show too, about the various early, the very earliest days of profiling. So good people there. And a bunch of others, uh, younger ones you may not have heard of or worked with, Greg McCrary, another one, Steve Mardigian, folks that were kind of my mentors when I came in. My group was considered, we came in about 18 of us strong in 95. We were considered the third generation 
of FBI profilers. So Douglas Ressler, Hazelwood, first generation, other people maybe second, and then I, uh, my group is considered sort of the third generation. I'm proud to be part of it. All right, thank you. Uh, students always want to know how to get into the FBI. It seems like it's one of those elite uh, law enforcement agencies that requires, of course, a very good education. Uh, what was it like working for the FBI for you? Was it all that they say it is for you? And are shows like Criminal Minds accurate in their portrayal of criminal profilers and the type of work they do? Yeah, another excellent question. Uh, you have some smart students out at Bakersfield College, don't you? <laughs> we good, sure do. Good for you. Um, yeah, the FBI was everything I wanted to be. I was a police officer for 11 years, and I recount in my second book what it was like to be a police officer and the whole application process to become an FBI agent. And I don't lie to anybody. I took the FBI test. I didn't pass it the first time. And I had, I had to wait a whole year to take it again. And I was getting a little bit older. There was a hiring freeze going on in the mid-1980s. But I, uh, I, I actually hired a tutor to help me with some of the math parts. And this is all in my second book. And I took it the second time. And I passed, went through the interview process, and everything went from there. Um, so the, uh, the FBI Academy was difficult. Not everybody made it through. Um, there was about uh, 40 of us, maybe uh, eight women and about uh, 32 uh, men. Um, and um, the numbers are a little more even now. I think it's about 20% women in the FBI. We're always looking to recruit all kinds of people of all walks of life, colors and creeds and, and identities and all that stuff, as long as you're qualified and you can bring something to the table and offer it there. Um, but I was really impressed with some of my colleagues, um, uh, my, my fellow students at the academy. I went to New York City and I was putting a bank robbery task force right away with a bunch of police NYP detectives and FBI agents. And I fit in very well there since I was already a police officer for 11 years. And we they had all kinds of bank robberies back then in New York. And we were doing two and three bank robbery investigations per day. Um, so, um, and kidnappings and other types of threat cases. So uh, yeah, I was very busy in, in New York and very busy seven years later when I transferred, promoted to Quantico. Um, a lot of it is paperwork. They don't show, they never show in criminal minds where the, uh, the agents are doing their, you know, long reports, sitting in front of a computer or reviewing pictures and maps and listening to with headphones of, of long interviews of suspects, things like that. Um, uh, and not to mention going to court and testifying, waiting in line and being cross-examined by, you know, a defense attorney that they're doing everything they can to try to uh, you know, belittle uh, you or, or at least challenge you in that regard. But it's all part of the adversarial system in which we live. So there were some very boring times. I can talk about surveillances of bank robbers who were sitting for days in a row at a house or a car waiting for someone to come out. And it's, you know, not always easy to stay awake during those times, but you have to. Um, again, writing reports and all can be boring, but you got to do them right. You got to make sure you put nothing in there that you know, a defense attorney can use against you. I mean, you tell, you tell the truth, of course, everything is in there, but nothing they can pick apart and try to use against you at time of trial. So, um, but yeah, I wouldn't have traded my 20 years for anything uh, in the FBI or my 31 years in law enforcement. I really felt I was giving something back to my community. I didn't grow up wanting to be a cop. You can read my first and second book uh, and how I kind of fell into where I did. Uh, I actually have a YouTube, or a, um, on YouTube, a TEDx talk, uh, just hit James Fitzgerald, Penn State TEDx. Uh, I did it right before the pandemic kicked in uh, last year. And I tried to talk to younger people, because it was a college group I was talking to about, you know, how do you, how do you pick your career? How do you know what you wanna do in life? And without repeating all that here, check out my, uh, uh, my TEDx talk and you'll, and you'll see uh, what, what I offer to young students and young people in that regard. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a service type job and uh, you're giving something back. You're not gonna become wealthy. I feel bad for police officers today. They have a, they're taking a lot of heat from uh, the public, uh, not deserved, I believe. All, everyone in every walk of life makes mistakes. Professors make mistakes, doctors make mistakes, police officers make mistakes, it happens. But I think uh, this defund the police we're seeing now, it's, it's, it's a very difficult time for us. And, uh, 
and it's certainly uncalled for. We still need good people to go out there and protect our communities, protect our people. And I hope some of the folks in the audience would consider that. Um, not everyone in the FBI is former, former law enforcement like me. We have former military people. Uh, we have former lawyers and accountants, or they're still lawyers, and accountants, language specialists, computer specialists. Uh, if, if, and again, language, it's nice to be fluent in German or French, but the languages we really need today are Russian and Chinese and Urdu and, uh, and, and the various dialects out of Afghanistan, no doubt, Farsi. So uh, these are the languages that we consider priority, criterion languages, and if you can speak those, that's, uh, you'd be getting into the FBI pretty quickly. So um, I never had a bad day in the FBI. Some, day were better, some days were better than others, but every day was a challenge and no day was exactly like the one before. So if, uh, and that applies to law enforcement on the whole. It doesn't have to be FBI, it could be Secret Service, it could be alcohol, tobacco, firearms, or US Marshals, local police, state police. Uh, it's a noble profession. And I hope uh, people will seriously consider looking into it after maybe some of these storm clouds blow over us that we're seeing uh, in the media and in our culture now. All right, thank you. Uh, after working on a case, the Unabomber case was 17 years long. And after working on a case for an extended period of time, does it affect your mental health? Did you ever have times where you just want to say, I'm done with this. I don't want to do it anymore. Do you get frustrated that you can't crack it? What, you're ready to, but it just keeps going on and on and on? Well, yeah. And especially when there are killings or rapes going on at the same time you're investigating them. And I, I've been either directly or indirectly involved in cases like that. And it's very, very difficult. And before I forget up front, if you have watched Manhunt Unabomber, in the very opening episode, there's the Fitz character portrayed by Sam Worthington, you know, living in a cabin off the grid in the middle of nowhere with his hair long and big beard and eating raw fish. And that never happened in real life. The writers threw that in uh, just to add some, you know, uh, literary, as literary license to add some drama to the whole thing. But, uh, you know, I learned early on, um, there's an expression, Chinese wall, you know, the literal Chinese wall, but also how to separate parts of a, of a company or, or they call it the silo effect now too. And I learned as a young police officer, um, when I would drive home, I would look at a certain street sign or, or billboard, whatever it was. And I would say, from this point on, I'm not thinking about work anymore. I'm going home. I'm thinking now about my home life. Uh, you know, married, kids, all that stuff back then. And I would reverse it going to work the next day. Not that I'd ever have my family out of my mind, but all right, time to focus on work now. And I saw some awful things as a police officer, car accidents, homicide scenes. I've interviewed rape victims. Uh, I've been to scenes of suicides with a family. I had to notify family members and, and it's awful. And, and you have to learn early on, you have to train yourself you have to put that wall in your brain somehow, and you have to delineate your work life from your personal life. I would come home and tell my kids as they got a little bit older, some funny things that happened at work, even about an arrest. Oh, we arrested this guy, and here's what he said, and here's what he thinks. But, but anything that was violent or, you know, the extreme victimization of, uh, of someone, I, I wouldn't want to share that with my family or a loved one. Years later in the FBI, I mean, I... I as a police officer, and even in New York, I was on crime scenes where, to be a little graphic, the body was still warm, the victim is still, you know, the rapist just left a half hour before, and I've interviewed or had to control these crime scenes. Later in my profiling years, I was mostly dealing with pictures, videos, and written statements. I wasn't going to crime scenes as much. Uh, I remember one that was very difficult was when two Dartmouth College professors were murdered in their home in early 2001, they lived across the state line in Vermont, but uh, we weren't sure what we had there was this organized to kill two older professors. And, um, and I was within two days, I walked through that crime scene, there was still blood on the floor. So, but I had to make sure I got that scene out of my mind. Uh, once I left the area and I would write my reports, talk to the investigators, give my profile. Um, 
but it's some cops and some agents can't do it that well. I found the key and I tell this to law enforcement people now, <clears throat> the key to success, I think this applies to any field, even professors, have friends that do things different than what you do. Don't have all your friends be a professor. If you're a doctor, don't have all your friends be a doctor. And, and law enforcement don't have all your friends be cops or FBI agents. And it pays just to get off with those folks um, and, and, and just talk about, quote unquote, you know, normal life stuff. And that way you're not constantly, you're looking to listen to their life, maybe their work stories and their family stories and go from there. So I find that to be a, a, a key for me in life that I kept my friends from childhood, from grade school, high school, all through my career to this day. And they're really my best friends. Of course, I have very good friends in the FBI and even from my police days with whom I keep in contact. But it, you just need that diversification of your own social circle, your own personal environment. And that would certainly help uh, keep, keep, uh, you know, keep those demons from coming into your head and bothering you about some of these scenes that you see or cases that you're working where you can't just solve them as quickly as you would like. When you know there are women or children or whomever being victimized, but you have to work within the constitution. You may even have a good suspect, but you can't go and arrest that person because the probable cause is not there. So, uh, but you can, uh, you can work to separate that part of your brain and read other types of books, watch other types of TV shows and movies and uh, keep yourself busy otherwise. And you can minimize these haunting images that uh, yes, I still carry, but they're in the far recesses of my brain. And, uh, and they don't, they don't control who I am to this day. Okay, thank you. Um, in the in this case of the Unabomber, um, there were several victims that were seriously injured. And uh, I believe what you said, only three actually died. Were any of the victims compensated after all this was over financially? And do they look at you like in high regard that this case finally came uh, to be resolved? and it brought closure that he was arrested. Do you hear from them or what happened to the victims? I've been in touch. The only victim I've been in touch with is uh, Professor Galerntner from Yale University. Uh, we've shared some emails uh, in the last few years and <clears throat> he knew my role in the case, whatever. Um, now as a profiler in this particular, in that particular investigation, I had no direct reason to have any um, sort of intimate conversations or up close and personal conversations with the victims. Uh, in terms of compensation, I guess every state works at different with crime victims, but um, uh, the Unabomber, uh, when the Unabomber was wanted by the FBI in 1994, a $1 million reward was offered for him. <clears throat> At the time, that was the highest reward ever offered in any case anywhere. Uh, eventually, uh, David Kaczynski read the manifesto, identified his brother to the FBI, and we know, you know where that went. Uh, to David's great credit, yes, he took the reward. He claimed the reward. And after taxes and paying off some very basic legal fees that he had accrued, uh, helping to, uh, you know, bring his brother on board um, and, and be identified. He donated every other penny to the victims of the case. Now, I'm not sure exactly who took what or what amount went to either of them, but uh, it was a million dollar reward. I'm sure after taxes, it was almost you know down to 600,000. I'm sure he paid a few thousand dollars for, uh, for legal fees, but we'll say a half a million plus was uh, distributed to the victims. But I have no idea. It's not my interest. If they if they took the maximum amount, good for them. If they took nothing, good for them too. I would respect them either way. But uh, but I do respect David Kaczynski for uh, for what he did and how he did it. Okay, very good. Um, in working as an FBI agent, um, what kind of what kind of uh, trainings do you? I have students that always ask, well, what do they train you on? And how do you know if you want to uh, become a profiler or if you should get a degree in accounting and look at uh, books uh, from fraud? 
uh, how do you make your mind up? Do you, do you go in with a degree already or can you make your mind up when you're in the academy as to which field and what kind of investigative work you'll do? Yeah, I write this in my, the end of my second book. The FBI is a very unusual career in that you quit your present job and you, especially to be a special, to be a special agent, and you go to the FBI Academy, you have no guarantee you're graduating. Maybe you can't shoot a gun. Maybe you can't run and do the push-ups and sit-ups. Uh, maybe you can't pass the academics. So you don't know, you're not guaranteed you're going to pass. Number two, you're not going to know what city they send you to. Number three, once you get to that office, that city, you don't even know what kind of crimes you're going to be investigating. Now, if you have an accounting background, they will probably put you on a white collar squad, but you don't have that choice. And I knew some accountants who were sick of working white collar crimes after a while, and they wanted to do other kinds of crimes. Um, if you have a language specialty, in other words, if you're fluent in certain languages and it's one that's needed by the Bureau, you may be working some wiretaps or looking at um, you know, some, you know, transcribing interviews or translating them, whatever like that. That wouldn't be your full-time job as a special agent. There are full-time uh, translators and interpreters are hired for that. But you certainly would have a knowledge potentially of that culture and you'd be utilized there. If you have a computer skill set, you would uh, be using a computer program that every division has. Maybe your former military or, uh, or law enforcement, you may want to join one of the SWAT teams. And these are all like ancillary um, activities you have as an FBI agent. You still work your cases at your desk every day, nine to five and out in the field. But you may also uh, uh, you know, do some SWAT work. You may also do some side computer work or something when you can. And if you really get to be a, a, have a specialty in a certain field, you can then ask to be promoted to either FBI headquarters or, um, or, uh, or the FBI Academy, the laboratory. And they may put you, and you may do that computer work, or uh, or even you'd be a legal instructor at the FBI Academy if you have a law degree. Um, if you want to be a profiler, it certainly wouldn't hurt you to have an undergrad degree in maybe psychology, maybe criminal justice, or if not one of those, maybe your master's degree is in something like that. And I know the last thing the students want to hear in undergrad is they may need a ma you don't need a master's degree to get in the FBI but it's a highly competitive uh, position, especially special agent. And to have that secondary uh, graduate degree would only help you through the door. The median age of agents being hired is 30. Um, uh, so most of you may be younger and you still have a few years to go in that regard, but there's a strong uh, analyst uh, uh, position in the FBI. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of analysts, they're not, they don't carry guns, they don't carry badges, they don't make arrests, but they are integral to the investigations that the FBI undertakes. And uh, so if you if you just don't feel that you wanna be an actual special agent, <coughs> excuse me, there's absolutely nothing wrong with being a uh, an analyst and, uh, and helping your country and the FBI and working side by side with agents to, uh, to get the job done. All right. Well, we've come to the end of this presentation. We want to thank you so much, James, for being here today at BC and our students. I'm sure I'm going to give them extra credit for watching today. And uh, we thank you so very much. Um, and I, I just uh, wish you the best in this year. I know you, you mentioned you had a storm watch where you are in Maryland, and I hope everything works out uh, weather-wise there. Well, thank you, and no more other earthquakes for you guys either, okay? Thank you again uh, all so much for joining us. If you're interested in finding out about our upcoming speakers, uh, please click on the links in the chat. That's bakersfieldcollege.edu forward slash student events forward slash DSS, or just check out our BC calendar in general. You can find a plethora of events happening across campus. So again, thank you all so much, James. Really a pleasure, Pat, a true pleasure. Thank you for facilitating the conversation, and we will see you at our next event. Uh, remember that we can uh, find this video, uh, the recording uploaded to our YouTube page, and it'll be available up to two weeks for all of our students, staff, and faculty. Until then, we'll see you all. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.